it's a kind of a relentless thing. They would come out, most of them would come in very, very low. You know, they'd come in low, and uh, what you would do is you put in a, 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 a wall. You couldn't hit them because they're coming too fast and too low. So what you do is you just lay out a, a wall of anti-aircraft fire, and hopefully they would fly into it. So you just you set your, 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 your uh, missiles or your bullets for lack of a shells for a certain distance and a certain height and you just keep shooting for that area and then they would come in a lot of them got hit and went down but the uh, one of them went to cartwheel actually in front of our ship and went like that into another ship and uh, it was just exploded. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. One of the turning points of World War II was winning the Battle of the Atlantic in May of 1943. It was a battle that had to be won if the Allies ever hoped to invade Western France and defeat Nazi Germany. The German submarine fleet proved to be one of the greatest threats to Allied victory in Europe. Without command of the sea lanes leading to England, the Normandy invasion would not have been successfully conducted when it was. One vessel that greatly contributed to victory in the Atlantic was the United States Navy's destroyer escort. Destroyer escort was a speedy ship smaller than a regular destroyer, but specifically equipped for anti-submarine warfare on the high seas. Employed in numbers around a ship convoy bound for England, the escorts effectively countered the dreaded Nazi U-boat, and overcame its dominance on the sea lanes. Serving on board several of these destroyer escorts was Peter Scholes, who joined the U.S. Navy at age 21 in 1942. A college student at the time, he joined the service because of patriotism and adventure. He served on four different destroyer escorts during the course of the war on the Atlantic as well as in the Pacific. It was in a small college in East Orange, Uppsala College. I was studying a science, pursuing a science curriculum. I had intended to go to medical school. Uh, and uh, it was a typical small town college, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, the war was something that was in Europe. We knew that it was, it was a serious business, but we didn't pay any attention to it, really. Uh, the average person, the average college kid. Uh, I was more concerned, for some reason, I was more concerned about what was happening what, could possibly happen in the Pacific. I thought that was our greatest threat. But uh, really to, to, to say that we sat around and talked about the war or anticipated uh, our, act, our activities in the war, we just didn't do it. We had a hell of a lot of fun. It was a good time to be in college, as always. Can you just uh, describe what a destroyer escort was like and what its mission happened to be? Well, the destroyer escort, there were several several classes. We were the Edsel class, which was designed 
primarily for anti-submarine warfare and anti-aircraft warfare, actually. It was a small destroyer. It weighed about 1,400 tons. And for some frame of reference, the destroyer is a small, the next class of destroyer is about 1,800 to 2,000 tons. And the, it had, this particular class was propelled by diesel engines. We had four Fairbanks Morse diesel engines, two on each shaft. We had twin screws. It was about 310 feet long uh, and about 30, 33 feet wide. And it sat about 10 feet in the water, uh, 10 foot 10 to 12 foot draft. It was outfitted with uh, three inch guns, 40 millimeter, 20 millimeter, and of course depth charges, and, and what we call K guns, which would fire depth charges off to the side. Uh, that's, it, it's a great ship. It was a very seaworthy thing, a very bumpy ship to, to ride on. But once you got used to the motion of it, it was really a very, very hardy and very it's very seaworthy. It what was, was a, its mission, Peter? Its mission was anti-submarine, in the Atlantic, was anti-submarine warfare. We, we uh, took convoys from the East Coast over to England, mostly to England. Some of them broke off and went into Russia, Murmansk, but mostly to England. It was interesting. We'd get, we'd take a convoy, a typical convoy was about 100 ships. In fact, the first convoy I was on had 108 ships on it, if you want to you want to picture that. And around the front of the, the convoy, there was uh, six or eight destroyer escorts and one tail end guy at the, at the back of the convoy. But then as we got closer to England, uh, the convoy would split and then British ships would come in to supplement our screen to make it a more, more intense screen, more, more impenetrable screen. And then there would be a split some would go off to Russia, some would go into Northern Ireland and then down the Irish Sea, and others would go up the English Channel into uh, like Portsmouth and uh, all the seaport, Cardiff, Liverpool, all, all those areas. But the, uh, I had great admiration for the British. <laughs> you know, those guys, you know, they, they, were, they were great seamen to begin with. They, they, of course, their history is the sea. And their ships, they didn't have the time to maintain them. And at first sight, you would say, look at that hunk of junk. What kind of a tub is that? They just didn't have the, the time to, like we had to maintain the ships. They were at sea all the time. They were rusty and they were awful looking. But boy, those guys knew how to handle them. They're excellent seamen. Peter, you just described the, the makeup of a convoy, how the destroyer escorts were deployed, yeah. how many were in the convoy itself. What I'd like to describe now is what a typical day on board a destroyer escort was like for you. Well, an officer on a destroyer escort, your primary duty was um, as deck officer. For a period of four hours, you were in charge of the ship up on the bridge, and you did everything you had to do to, to navigate, keep the ship in position, and to run the ship. Then you had eight hours off, four on and eight off. And during those eight hours, you had other responsibilities. The, uh, you had a division. For example, I had the sea division, which was the radar men, the radio men, the sound men, the navigator. The, the, and the, you know, these were all intelligent kids, and we were all kids. And, and it was hard to maintain a balance between being their boss and yet being a peer. So but these were intelligent guys, and, and so you had to be on your toes with them. So that was the other assignment. And then uh, during a, uh, if you were called to battle stations, my station was the anti-submarine officer and I had to get up on the bridge and evaluate the sound contact and then start the attack. Uh, usually I would run it or the captain, depending on how, you know, how, how he felt about it, he would take over and he would run it. Uh, and then we'd go ahead and do, and do the attack and do, do what had to be done. The, uh, Did your escort ever spring into action against a German U-boat? Yes. And if so, Peter, would you please tell us about it? Well, this was off the uh, English coast in the uh, near Landsat, the approaches to England. I remember when we left on this particular convoy, 
In a pre-convoy conference, they had a map with pins on it to show the sightings, submarine sightings. <laughs> My first impression when I saw it, I said, how the hell are we going to get through that? I never saw such a massing of, of pins, you know. We're, but anyway, we, we uh, took the convoy over, and just before we got into England, we began to get these contacts. And you'd run off and, and fire, and one of the destroyers would chase it down and keep it down. In the meantime, the convoy moved along. Uh, this one particular one that we got was a solid contact. And then I, you know, I said to the salmon, I said, this is a solid one, let's go. And we, we dropped in about three hours, we dropped 91 depth charges, which is seven, seven patterns, 13 uh, depth charges to pattern. I think we got the ship. I think we got the submarine. Of course, you don't get credit for it in the Navy. You know, naval. You don't get official credit for a sinking unless you. It's a gruesome thing to say unless you have, unless you recover human remains. Uh, we have oil. We had debris, debris, and everything. But we, fortunately, maybe we didn't get get any. Uh, didn't recover any human remains. But I'm sure we got that one, because there's a special. Uh, there's a special projectile that we had. It was called a hedgehog, which is really a, a forward-firing depth charge. And those things only go off if they make contact. And we fired two patterns of those besides the depth charge, and they both went off. So I think, I think we, uh, we either sank this guy or he gave him, a lot of, gave him an awful headache. The, uh, it was, a, it was quite, a, quite a skirmish. You had mentioned that you had seen at times, the torpedoing of one ship after another. Can you describe the torpedoing of a ship and what actions were taken to save the lives of those on board? Well, this uh, actually, this, 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 this what particular hits that I'm talking about happened the second night out of New York. It was a convoy composed mostly of gasoline and oil tankers. And uh, there was a troop ship. And incidentally, the troop ship was the Ericsson. And it seemed to me that that Ericsson was in every convoy, <laughs> but it carried troops to, to Europe. But uh, this, I was in the in the uh, in the after uh, officers' quarters. I was a very junior officer at the time, and uh, I was called. I was. I, what would happen is they would buzz me first, so to give me time to get up on the bridge before the general quarters, because uh, when those sailors start falling out of their their sacks, you can't get through. <laughs> So I'd got a buzz, and I started out, and uh, I no sooner got in the crew, I was carrying my life jacket and the helmet or whatever, and I no sooner got in the cruise quarters, and the general alarm went off, and these guys came out. I lost everything. In fact, I, I was up on the main deck running to the bridge. All I had on <laughs> was my, my skimmies, <laughs> and I'm running up to the... But anyway, I got out on the main deck, and I saw this burning ship. I'm all excited. Well, maybe thousand yards off on the right. And I, uh, I, my first reaction was to yell. And I think I yelled all the way up to the bridge. You know, the excitement of it. So I was shouting. And I don't know what I was shouting, but I, was, I remember yelling. And what had happened was that the Germans had, uh, submarines had what was called an acoustic torpedo. It homed in on the sound, very much like today's smart bombs. And it honed in and hit this particular ship, which was an oil tanker, SO tanker. Uh, it was carrying high octane gas, incidentally. And it uh, hit it in the, in the stern, and then it in turn went over and smacked into another ship and was burning furiously. So we maneuvered in close to the ship because there were still guys on, on, this, on the tanker. We were telling them to jump, jump in the water and jump onto the ship. And they were reluctant to do it. I, I can still see one guy, you know, waving with the flames behind him, but still he didn't want to jump off. And of course, he was lost. Uh, then the uh, then there were a lot of lot of fellows in the water, some badly burned. And we uh, we helped them out on the water. We, we 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 dropped the cargo net over the side of the ship. In the meantime, the convoy had gone. It was still going. He couldn't stop. We dropped the cargo net over, and we were pulling people, you know, go down the cargo net and pulling guys over to the to the ship. 
uh, I, as I, I don't remember doing that. I was told that I was doing that I did that, but I, I don't really remember it. B.B. James was my buddy, and, and he was on the other side of the car. And he said, you and Mr. James are pulling these fellows out of the water. I, I, I can't visualize myself down there because I can't swim, but that's another whole story. But we, uh, we pulled them over, and, they, and we got them aboard, and the doctor treated them. Uh, we lost a lot of them. Uh, in fact, the following morning, we were still patrolling. And this is not kind of gruesome, but anyway, there was a... There was one of the uh, crewmen was in the water, and he had been, he was dead. And he, the sh there was a shark attacking him and, and was rolling him over and to, to, to bite at him. And I was so furious and so frustrated, I, I got a rifle and I'm shooting at the shark. <laughs> of course, it didn't bother the shark. It probably missed him by a mile. But it was that frustration and anger and, and, and seeing human life wasted that was it was difficult to, to deal with sometimes. Peter, you referred to your first visit to Okinawa and I'd like you to describe what, what you saw. Well, that was a bad time in Okinawa. That was when there was the kamikaze attacks and the, uh, we went up with the carriers and we were sent to a uh, uh, Fox 1 position, which was like a picket line. I was on a different destroyer at that time. But we were sent up closer to the, uh, uh, what do they call them? Nancy Shoto chain of islands that came down from Japan. We were sent up there to, 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 to intercept any kamikaze formations coming down to warn the fleet uh, so that they could prepare and, and fight off the kamikaze. The, uh, but we had gotten an app, they detached us from the carriers and he said, go up there and do that and be, be part of the radar picket. We had no sooner got there when they said, now you better come back and take care of the carrier. So we turned around and there was an APH that took our place, the Rixi. APH stands for what? Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an attack transport, carried troops in towards the beach for just debarking on smaller landing craft, but on the way out, it served as a hospital ship. It was, so it was an attack transport hospital ship, APH, and that was the H de designation. But it was set for all, of all ships, and it was sent to be part of the picket line because we were running sort of ships. There was a, ships, there was a hundred and, I think 107 destroyers either sunk or damaged in that kamikaze stuff. That was a, it was like a meat grinder. So uh, the APH took our place, the Rixi, USS Rail. Never get and no sooner did we re get back to the carriers when the APA, when the Rixi was hit badly. So we would have been, we would have gotten if we were up there. So we were lucky. And we got back to the carriers, and uh, we we patrolled in that area, and that was pretty much. There was a lot of, there was a lot of many many ships were sunk in that, and there was a lot of activity. It was. Fourth of July, <laughs> but uh, this may be difficult for you. But Peter, can you describe a kamikaze attack on any one of the ships that you yeah, were protecting? Well, yeah, we, it's a it's a kind of a relentless thing. They would come out. Most of them would come in very, very low. You know, they'd come in low, and uh, what you would do is you put in a a, 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 a wall. You couldn't hit them because they're coming too fast and too low. So what you do is you lay out a, a wall of anti-aircraft fire and hopefully they would fly into it. So you just you set your, 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 your missiles or your, 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 your bullets, for lack of another, shells for a certain distance and a certain height, and you just keep shooting for that area. And then they would come in, and a lot of them got hit and went down. But the, uh, one of them went to cartwheel, actually, in front of our ship and went like that into another ship and uh, it just, just exploded. The, uh, the thing about it is the noise. You know, it's, you go to a 4th of July thing, you go to, to a, a fireworks, you know it's going to end <laughs> pretty soon. It's going to do it and then there'll be a grand finale. I mean, this never ended. It just kept going and going and going. And day so, as well as night? Day and night, sure. Night, evenings, so you, it, it just didn't stop. 
We were given orders to go into Kiran, which is north northeast tip of Formosa, to open a prison camp. Now, the second atom bomb had been dropped by then, so that the war, for all practical purposes, were over, was over, but they hadn't signed any peace thing. So we were told to go into uh, to open this, this prison camp. The, the man running the camp was a was believe it was a Navy uh, Japanese Navy commander, and I met him and we went up the, uh, the the center of town out to the prison camp with my sailors, which was which is really a laugh. They they got into the excitement as they had all kinds of of, of gear on the boots and the machetes, and you think they were <laughs> cowboys. Uh, it, again, going back to what I said before, the informality of, of our ship. I, I was wearing my officer's hat, a pair of shorts, uh, sweat socks and, and moccasins, and a T-shirt and a sidearm. That's, I mean, that was, our, that was my uniform. But anyway, we went to the prison camp, and this is something I'll never forget. These were prisoners from from Singapore, Hong Kong, Burma, mostly British and Australian, had been in a prison camp for about three years, uh, or, or more, some of them. Skin and bones, they were just, and they had all been together in this prison situation, working during the day in, in mines and in fields there. Malnutrition was, was rampant, they were all underfed. But, and we got in, got to that camp, and these, and these guys, they saw us, they went crazy. Here come the Yanks, the Yanks, we knew the Yanks. I never thought of myself as a Yank, but now I'm a Yank. You know? <laughs> Here come the Yanks. They picked us up and carried us on their shoulders. They could barely carry themselves, and they're carrying us around. I, I'll never forget, it was, a, it was the most exciting thing and the most heartwarming thing. But then the other thing that struck me was how quickly British discipline took over. And here are guys living together as peers, if that's the right word, all suffering the same, the same misery and all eating the same food, officers and men. But as soon as it looked like things were going to go back to normal, British discipline came into place. These guys, you know, they, they formed ranks. The officers became a separate group again. They had their orderlies, they call them Batmen, who now assumed a different position. Instead of being all together, now the, the discipline took place. And, and these guys walked down, had to be at least three miles, you know, and when the final take, walked down to the docks in, in order, carrying each other or, or whatever they could do, but in, you know, as military as you could possibly get, skin and bones. What actions would you change if you had a chance to relive those years again? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm glad I lived that time. I'm glad I survived it. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I would do anything different. I, I would hope that I would get the same kind of ship and with the same kind of people on it. Uh, this, was a, there was a, this was an unusual, I don't know how they did it. I don't know if it was by a design or what, but uh, we had a crew that was perfect for the job, and they were all from Pike County, Kentucky. <laughs> they, were, they were recruited or, or enlisted or whatever, or, or drafted in, in, as a group, and they were all relatives. They all knew one another, you know, and, uh, but very, very good. The southern first impression, well, how are these guys going to do all this technical stuff? But they were excellent. And that crew was great, and uh, I, I, my personally, I, I, don't, I wouldn't do anything else. I wish I was able to contribute more. I, I did what I, you know, there, there was the drudgery part of it, and a lot of convoy duty was drudgery. I mean, we, we had to take these lumbering ships, maybe a hundred at a time, over a hundred at a time across the Atlantic at a, at high speed convoys, fourteen point seven knots was high speed. So if you can imagine driving through from from uh, New York to to England at at about 18 miles an hour regular land speed with miserable weather day after day, you know it's it's kind of drudgery and you're almost looking for excitement, looking for something to happen. Uh, 
But personally, I, you know, I'm glad for the experience. I wouldn't want to do it again. And I hope we never have to do that again. Uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, I, as I say, I'm grateful for having had the experience. And I, and I don't think I'd do anything different than what I did. If young people today were called to action because of a general war, do you think they would respond the same way you did? Well, I would hope so. You know, you never know what you're going to do till the time comes. My first impression is these guys won't do it. We're kind of a tribal country now. We, we, we seem to be segmented into, into groups, uh, Latins, and blacks, and, uh, Muslim, or whatever. That's the identity. That, unless I have the wrong perspective, I see, I see us being tribal, and I wonder if, you know, when a time comes, and, and like, Pearl Harbor, whatever, where these fellows or these young people, men and women, will, will, will be able to rally around the flag because do they really recognize the flag now. I mean, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something that I'm worried about. Uh, it could be all wet because, as I said before, you never know. Until, until the time comes, you never know what you're going to do. I mean, myself, during the service, if I was told I was going to have to do this, I thought, are you out of your mind? I would say, I'm not going to do that. But when the time comes and you have to do it, you find you're doing it. And I hope if it ever happens that we have this kind of another crisis which would call for a mobilization of everybody, I hope the right feelings will come up in, in, among these young people and, and to do what has to be done. And I, I think they will. You know, you, you talk to individual people and you talk to individual young people, like the kids that I've met, kids, I shouldn't say, uh, young people that I've met here on campus today. I mean, I would have every feeling, I have every feeling that if the time comes and they have to do what we got to do, they'll do it.